no study on the gospel is complete without touching on the cross. So the next three studies, I would like to deal with the cross from three different approaches, three different angles. In this first study, I would like to show you how the cross of Christ exposed Satan as the murderer of our Savior. Then in our second study, we will look at the cross and how it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth. And then finally, which is the most important study, we will see how the cross of Christ demonstrated the fullness of the unconditional agape love of God towards mankind. Now with this in mind, let's turn to our first study. The Satan exposed at the cross. How the true character of Satan was exposed at the cross of Christ. Now this is an important study because we are told from the Bible that in the last days, Satan will appear as an angel of light to deceive the very elect. That is why we need to understand Satan's true character so that we will not fall for his lies. The great controversy between Christ and Satan began in heaven when Lucifer, the highest created being, rebelled against God and became Satan. Notice what the prophet Ezekiel has to say about this. Ezekiel chapter 28, and I would like to read verse 14 and 15. Ezekiel chapter 28. And I'm reading verse 14 and 15. You, talking about Lucifer, you were anointed, the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. So this God established him. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. So he was the highest created being that God had established. Now look at verse 15. You were Perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now the word iniquity in Hebrew means bent towards self. And we are going to see this as we turn to Isaiah 14 verse 12 to 14. His iniquity bent to self was to overthrow God and take his place in the universe. So let's see what the prophet Isaiah has to say about this. Chapter 14 of Isaiah, verse 12 to 14. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, please notice, he did not say this publicly, he said it in his heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation, on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. So here is Satan, Lucifer, who has now become Satan, wanting to take the place of God. Having deceived one third of the angels, so he must be quite a powerful politician. He's deceived one-third of the angel, angelic host, Satan waged war against Christ, his creator. We are told in several passages, and one of them is John 1 verse 3, that Christ is the creator of this universe. All things were made by him. So here is Lucifer turning against his own creator. However, Christ and his angels were victorious in that battle, and Satan and his angels were cast out of heaven. And this battle is explained or recorded in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 7 to 9. Listen to what the Apostle John penned here. Chapter 12 of Revelation, I read verse 7, 8, and 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael, which is one of the titles for Christ, and his angels fought with the dragon. This is Satan. And the dragon and his angels fought. But they did not prevail. That is, the dragon and his angels did not prevail. Nor was a place found to them in heaven anymore. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, 
called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. This is the beginning of the great controversy, folks, between Christ and Satan. Now, being expelled from heaven, Satan deceived Adam and Eve and made this world his dominion. You see, when God created this world, he gave dominion of this world to the entire human race. You know, I want to give you an experience. I was traveling in Uganda with another missionary, and it was a very hot day. We had a sack lunch, and he said to me, this is all grassland, we call it savanna. I see two trees in the distance. Can you park your car under the shade so we can have our lunch? So I went over this grassy ground, and guess what? As we had parked the car under the tree, there were two lions having their siesta. You know, an average lion sleeps about 20 hours a day. Now, in America and other parts of the world, lions are in zoos, they are in cages, and we are free. But in Africa, they are free, and we have to be in our cages. So we were in our car, in our cage. I put the windows up, and we kept looking at the lion while we ate our sandwiches, while the lion looked at us in anger because we disturbed him and he growled at us. Well, when, it was all, when our lunch was over, I turned the key to leave, and the car would not start. It happened to be a Ford. And they tell me in this country, have you driven a Ford lately? Well, it was a British Ford. The only way I could start the car was to get out, open the hood, and there was a button under the hood to start the car. Do you know an average lion weighs about 350 to 400 pounds, can break the neck of a human being with one slap? I was no match for that lion. And these lions would stay up in the branches until about 6.30 in the evening when they would get off to make their kill. We had an appointment in a place called Fort Portal at the foot of the mountain of the moon. So what we did was a human solution. We opened the front doors of our car, we put our legs out and we tried to push the car away from the lion. But there was a big clump of grass behind one back wheel. And all we could do was rock the car up and down until we were exhausted. And my missionary friend said to me, you know, God protected Daniel in the lion's den. So what are you afraid about? And I said to him, that's a nice children's story. This is reality. And he said to me, that, that was also reality. Then we did what we should have done. We prayed and asked God to protect me. Now, you know, I don't know if you're aware that when human beings are afraid, we let out a smell that wild animals can smell. And no amount of sure can cover that smell. So how do you walk before a huge lion that can break your neck with one slap? Well, I'll tell you what I did. I gave the lion a Bible study to keep me, you know, comfortable or to keep my fear from not expressing itself. Now, I gave a Bible study from Psalms chapter 8, which is also what God told Adam and Eve. I said to the lioness, because it was the lioness that was closest to me, when I stood up and I stretched my hand, I could touch its tail. That's how low she was. And the other killers. And I said to her, I know you're greater, bigger than me, I know you're stronger than me, but God has given mankind dominion over all the beasts of the field. And the lion looked at me, cocked his head up, as if to say, who are you kidding? But in the meantime, I had the hood open, my eyes was on the lioness all the time, and I pressed the button, the car started, and the lioness did something that your cat does before pouncing on a bird. It twitched its tail. And I think I broke the Olympic record. <laughs> I was in that car before she could step down. Well, when she saw me going back into the car, she reversed, re went back to a branch, and I drove about... 50 yards and got out and put the hood down. Now, I could say that because God gave the human race dominion over all the beasts of the field, all the vegetation, the whole world. But when Adam yielded to Satan's temptation, he handed over the dominion of this world to him. In Luke chapter 4, we have the second temptation of Christ in the wilderness. And there we read how devil took Christ to the high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. That is the entire human race. And the Satan said to him, All this is 
mine. I have authority over the whole world. It has been delivered to me and I can give it to you. All you have to do is bow down and worship me. Of course, Christ did not do that. But he did not challenge Satan's claim. In fact, on more than one occasion, Christ referred to Satan as the prince of the Lord of this world. So please remember that when Adam fell, not only did he plunge this into the sin problem, but he also surrendered the whole world, the whole dominion of this world to Satan. He became the prince, the ruler of this world. Ever since the fall of Adam and Eve, Satan became the prince or ruler of this world. This is what I mentioned. John 14 verse 30 is Jesus talking. And he says, the ruler of this world has come and can find nothing in me. That's what Christ called Satan, the ruler of this world. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4, Paul calls him the Lord of this world. So that's what's happened at the fall. Now, thus the great controversy which began in heaven between Christ and Satan was transferred from heaven to this earth at the fall. That is the beginning of the downfall of Satan. Let's now look at the downfall of Satan. Satan's true character first began to be exposed when Christ, his arch enemy, came to this world to be savior of mankind. See, when Satan took over this world, he developed this world under his system of self. That is why everything in this world, whether it is commerce or education or sports or even in religion, self is the very heart of our behavior. You look at the, all the advertising you see on the, on the side streets or on the roads, you will notice the appeal is to self. And Satan became the ruler of this world, the principle of self. But he had to be exposed. And one of the reasons why Jesus came to this world is to expose Satan as our arch enemy. He came to this world to be savior of mankind, to redeem, and the word redeem is to buy us back. Now, note how Satan attempted to kill Christ. Christ came as a babe in a manger in Bethlehem. The first attempt is found in Matthew 2, verse 1 to 18. Remember what Herod the Great, and by the way, all of Satan's agents are great. Herod the Great controlled by Satan, sent a whole army, not just one soldier to kill a baby, a whole army, because Satan knew who Christ was. He was the Son of God in human form. So he sent a whole army to destroy, to kill every male child from the age of two and under. And you'll find this in Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 18. Did he succeed? And the answer is no. Now, the second attempt is found in Luke 4, verse 8 to 11. This is the third temptation of Christ in the wilderness. Satan took him to a high, to the top of the temple tower and said to him, You are the Son of God. Just jump. Your, the angels of God will protect you. But Jesus said to him, Get thee behind me, Satan. You should worship only God. Only the word of God is the power, the, the basis of my behavior. So he did not jump. And then number three, in John 10 verse 31, God used, or at least Satan used, the Jews to stone Christ. You know, Jesus made a statement, I and the Father are one, in verse 30. And the Jews took up stones to stone him. Why? Because they were being controlled by Satan. How do we know? How do we know? In all these attempts, first of all, we must discover, in all these attempts, Satan failed, and here is the reason why. And you and I, and all believers, need to know why he failed. Sorry, we look at two of the texts. John chapter 7, verse 30. And then we'll go to John chapter 8, verse 20. Both of these texts are saying the same thing. And we need to know this because as Christians, we are part of the body of Christ. And what happened to him can happen to us. 
chapter 7 of John, the Gospel of John, and I'm reading verse 30. In verse 29, to get the context, we read these words, but I know him, for I am from him. And he sent me. This is Jesus talking, and he's saying to the Jews, I know my father, I know God. He sent me. Look at verse 30. Therefore they sought to take him, but, here's the reason, no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. And as we shall see towards the end of this study, if your hour has not yet come, and I can give you many experiences when I was in the mission field, in Uganda under Idi Amin, in Ethiopia under communism, if your hour has not yet come, nobody can touch you. Now chapter 8 verse 20 says the same thing. I'm only giving you two texts. There are other texts that say the same thing. These words Jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. You see, God is sovereign. He's in control. Nobody can touch you if he says no. Now let's go on to see Satan's downfall. The only way God could expose Satan's true character was to remove his protection from his son, Jesus Christ. You see, Satan is a liar. He's a deceiver. He comes to us as an angel of light. And he's very successful in that. So the only way God could expose Satan, his true colors, his true character, was to allow him to do to Christ what he wants to do. And what is that? This he did at Gethsemane. In fact, this in Luke chapter 22, verse 53. Let's read it. Luke chapter 22 and verse 53. Chapter 22, and I read verse 53. Jesus is in Gethsemane. He's praying to his father. Father, if possible, remove the cup. And the father says, no. And Jesus prayed, thy will be done. And then an angry mob comes and takes him captive. And Jesus responds to this angry mob. Verse 53 of Luke 22. When I was with you daily in the temple... You did not try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. In other words, Christ is telling to this mob, you people are controlled by Satan, and God is allowing this to happen. He's allowing the power of darkness, which is Satan, to take hold of me. So this is where we begin to understand the downfall of Satan. At the cross... Satan was exposed as the murderer, as the murderer of the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. Here is the text, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And I want you to notice what Jesus said to these Jews who had rejected him. You know, you're either on God's side or on Satan's side. No one is a free person spiritually. Jesus said, either you're for me or against me. And these Jews had rejected Christ. Not all of the Jews, but this is the group of leaders that rejected him. And this is what Jesus said to them in John 8, 44. You are of your father, the devil. And the desire of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus is telling the Jews, you are of your father, the devil. Can you imagine? Here are the Jews who claim to be God's chosen people. And Jesus is probably insulting them, saying, you are of your father, the devil. But what he says is, Satan is a murderer from the beginning. Now we have to ask that question. Who did he murder in the beginning? Well, we're going to go to several applications. Here's the first application of this truth. Who did he murder from the beginning? Well, if the world is under Satan, hates us, Christian, is because he hated Christ. Now let me explain to you how or what Jesus meant by the word beginning. 
You remember we read in Ezekiel 28 verse 15 that Satan, Lucifer became Satan and decided to take over the kingdom of God. He wanted to get rid of Jesus Christ who was the, his creator. Now, please remember in the eyes of God, murder does not begin with an act. Jesus made that clear to the Jews of, the, of his time in the Sermon on the Mount. The Jews would stand up, especially the Pharisees, and say, I have never murdered anybody. And Jesus said, one moment, if you hate somebody in your heart, you have already murdered him. So while Satan did not murder anyone in an act, because he failed in the war, the war that took place in heaven, in his heart he wanted to murder the Son of God. He hated him because he wanted his place. So that is what Jesus meant. He was a murderer from the beginning. But the, this was not carried out until several, several centuries later when on the cross God allowed Satan to crucify his son. You remember what the Jews cried out who were controlled by the devil? Crucify him! And that revealed Satan's hatred towards Christ. Now, the first lesson we need to learn from this is this. If the world under Satan hates us, Christians, it is because he hated Christ first. John 15, verse 18, Christ makes this statement very clear. John 15. And please notice what Jesus said to his disciples in verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Verse 19, I would like to add, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. You know, Christians are redeemed from the world that is under Satan. The moment you accept Christ, you are changing your spiritual citizenship from the kingdom of this world under Satan to the kingdom of God under Christ. And when Satan loses a citizen from his kingdom, he's angry. He will hate you. He will do everything to destroy your faith in Christ. Now the second application. And this is what I want you to understand. If your hour has not yet come, Satan or his angels cannot touch you. For God is sovereign. And we read those two texts. John 7.30 and John 8.20. Since the church is the body of Christ, since we are the extension of Christ, he is the head, we are his body. What Satan did to Christ, he will do to you, if God allows. But he cannot touch you if God says no. Let me give you a couple of experiences quickly. I was the president of our college in Uganda, under Idi Amin. The country was under Idi Amin. He was a Islam, he was a Muslim. He hated Christians and his goal was to destroy Christianity within five years. So he tried to destroy the churches, all the denominations. So he banned 27 denominations. And for eight years, Christians worshipped in their home. Now one day, we had a lightning storm at our college. And the lightning hit the transformer and burned the fuse. Now in this country, or in America, all you do is pick up your phone and call the power company and they'll come and fix it. But not in Uganda. In fact, we didn't have a telephone. The only way we could fix, fix the problem, because the whole campus was without power, was to drive to the power station about 20 miles away, pick up the fuse, bring it back, and put it in there ourselves with 25,000 volts coming down. Very frightening. But there was a problem. Between our college and the power station about 20 miles, somewhere in between was the camp of Idi Amin soldiers. And they were noted for killing people and taking their cars. So nobody was willing to go to the power station, not even the maintenance men. They were all afraid. So I decided to go. And my missionary friend said, you're a fool. Why are you risking your life? And I said to them, no, no, Christians don't risk their life. We are already dead in Christ. You know, Colossians 3, 3 says, we are dead in Christ and we are hid in his life. But I speak Swahili, the language of East Africa. But Uganda also has their own language called Luganda. 
and I was struggling to learn that language. So I asked the dean of boys, he didn't want to go, but I, I could force him because I was the boss to come with me in case I needed a translator. And we drove, and as we were approaching the, the camp, there was a hut by the side of the road, and as we approached it, we heard the click of rifles. And the dean of boys said, step on the gas. And I said, no, these guys have automatic rifles. They pull the trigger, one bullet will hit you, one will hit me, we better stop. And I stopped and three drunken soldiers came out of the hut in anger. They opened the door and dragged us out and yelled at us. Apparently this was a checkpoint. But there was no sign, there was no barrier, and the soldiers were in the hut. How were we to know this was the checkpoint? So the dean of boys in Luganda was trying to explain to them why we did not stop. But these three soldiers came from a section of Uganda that did not speak Luganda. They spoke Swahili, the language I spoke. And the chief of them said to the other two guys, shoot him, that is shoot the dean of boys in Swahili. What would you do if you were in my place? They did not teach me in the seminary what to do with such circumstances. But I'll tell you what happened. My hand went automatically and I grabbed the rifle. And I yelled in Swahili, stand attention, Simama. And guess what? All three soldiers stood at attention and saluted me. And I said to them, don't you know who I am? And they began to apologize to me. And you know what, folks? These soldiers were trained by Israeli commanders. And they thought I was one of their officers. That's why they saluted me. And then I said to them, when I come back, I want you to stand attention here. And they said, yes, sir, Dio Buana, and saluted me. And we got in the car, and the dean of boys, his mouth was wide open. He said, what made you say that? And I said, remember what Jesus said to his disciples, when you face such circumstances, don't plan what you shall say. This is not situation ethics. God will put words in your mouth. The Holy Spirit will put words in your mouth. And the Holy Spirit knew exactly the language these people would understand. And so on our way back, guess what? These three soldiers were desperately trying to stand attention because they were drunk. And as I passed them, they saluted me and I saluted them. And we went home free. Well, unfortunately, not too long after that, Idi Amin deported me. And I was sent from, Ethiopia, from Uganda to Ethiopia. And one year later, we had the communist revolution. And I heard with my own ears, the new government of Ethiopia saying this, there is no more room for God in scientific socialist Ethiopia. And you know what, folks? The whole country was turned around. Hali Selassie was deposed, and then he was put to death. They say he died on the, uh, the surgery table, but we all believe that he was put to death. And everybody had to take classes on communism, at least the local people. Many, many, many Christians accepted communism because in practice it is brutal, but in ideology it is very appealing. Karl Marx said this, that communism is the scientific solution to the social and economic injustices of the world. And you know, at that time, Ethiopia was the third poorest country in Africa, according to the United Nations. They were, the people were peasants. They were living under a feudal system. 10% of the wealth of the country was in the hands, no, 90% was in the hands of 10%. The rest were living in poverty. So communism was very appealing to them. And many Christians gave up Christ. So what did I do? I sat down and wrote a book against communism. It was called, I, wrote, I titled it, Christianity versus Marxism. Now you dare not do that in a communist country. And you know what? I published the book in their language. We flooded this country. And five years later, I, had, I was transferred to Kenya. And you know what? My wife and I had to go to the immigration office to get exit visa. And this immigration officer, who was a diehard communist, had our passports in front of him. These were U.S. passports. And he kept looking at those passports and a thick ledger book, page by page, to see something. And after half an hour, I got impatient. I went up to him and said, what are you looking for? Maybe I can help you. And you know what he said to me? He said, in this book, we have the names of everyone that has opposed communism 
and I felt that cold chill go down my spine because I was sure my name was there. And I said to him, what will you do to me if my name is there? I am a U.S. citizen. And he was very sarcastic. He said, don't worry. We have special ways of dealing with such people. And you know what? What he meant? They shoot you and they dump you into the forest. And Ethiopia has an animal that you may have seen on the TV, the hyena. The average hyena has between 500, 500 to 1,000 pounds jaw pressure. And when they tuck into you at night, because they are nocturnal, they crush your bones. Every bit of you is in the stomachs of those animals. The CIA can never trace you. And so I went back to my bench with my knees knocking. And he kept looking for another two and a half hours. And then he took my passport and stamped the exit visa. What a sigh of relief. But I will tell you what happened during those two and a half hours. My faith and my feelings parted company. My feelings were all negative. I was sure I would never leave that country alive. But my faith said, I love you with an everlasting life. That's God speaking to me. My faith said, Jesus spoke to me, I will never forsake you. I will be with you to the end of the ages. And I held on to my faith in my Lord Jesus Christ. And after two and a half hours, he sent my exit visa, the exit visa in my passport, and a sigh of relief. My hour had not yet come. So my dear people, the time of trouble is coming upon us. People are living in fear, but... What we are seeing today is only the tip of the iceberg. That is why you need to have a faith that is unshakable. Okay, number three. Satan did something that the United Nations had failed to do. He united the two great enemies of Christ's day, the Jews and the Romans. They hated each other. But when, when Christ stood before the Pilate, who represented Rome, you know what the Jews said? We have no other king but Caesar. Satan can unite this world. And one day he will unite the world under Satan against the Christians. He's capable of doing that. United Nations has failed. Kissinger has failed. Every attempt, human error has failed. But Satan can do it when the time comes. He will do it. Because we are reading in Revelation that the whole world will follow after the beast whose power is been given by Satan. Okay, now number four. Okay, he will unite the whole world. And uh, this is the text that I just mentioned. Revelation 13, verse 3 and 4. The whole world will wander after the beast whose power is received by the dragon, who is Satan. Now, the fourth application. When the world under Satan has, made, has to make a choice between one of their own and an innocent Christian, they will always choose to release one of their own. Acts 3 verse 14 and 15 is the story of what took place before Pilate's court. Pilate said to the Jews, according to our custom, I will let one person free. I'm presenting before you the worst criminal I can find in my jail, Barabbas. And then you have Christ, in whom I find no fault. Which one of the two do you want me to set free? And you know, folks, the the Jews did not ask for a committee meeting. Immediately they responded, Give us Barabbas. And what will I do with Christ? Said, crucify him. Now, I want to make it something clear. The problem is not the Jews. The problem was, was Satan controlling them. And the same thing that Satan did with the Jews, he can do to you. So please don't blame the Jews for doing what they did. They were victims of Satan. And you can be a victim even as a Christian. Remember what Peter said to Jesus when he told them that he was to be crucified? Satan, uh, Peter took Jesus and shook him and said, this can never happen to you. And you know what Jesus said? Get thee behind me, Satan. So please remember it was not the Jews that cried out crucified. They were simply tools in the hands of Satan. As I mentioned earlier, you're either under Satan's rule or you're under Christ. There is no spiritual freedom in this world. And so that's what happened at the cross. But now the same thing will happen in the time of trouble. When God will allow God's people to be completely attacked by Satan. And you'll find this in the prophet's book of Isaiah, chapter 54, verse 5 to 8. Where Jesus says, I read him, Jesus says, For a small moment I will forsake you. 
In other words, in the time of trouble, this is the issue. Can, can God produce a people whose faith is unshakable as Christ was on the cross? That's the purpose. That's why we need to have a faith that is unshakable. Now number five. At the cross, man's unconscious sin. Remember, we have a nature that hates God. Our unconscious sin was revealed, the enmity that exists between our sinful flesh and God. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Who can know it? And Romans 8, 7 says that the sinful flesh or the mind controlled by the sinful flesh is enmity with God. And that was revealed at the cross. So it wasn't just the hatred of the Jews against Christ. It was the hatred of sinful flesh against the Son of God that was revealed. So may we never be on Satan's side. When you realize that on the cross, Satan was exposed as the murderer of our Savior. He may come to you as an angel light. He may come to you with all kinds of appeals. He may dangle before you the material things of this world. He may say to you, look, as a Christian you have many problems. Join me and I will make life wonderful. Remember, he's a liar and a deceiver. But above all, remember, he's a murderer of our Savior. Take, have no sympathy with him.